In the, uh, in the late 1980s, Japanese scientists came to the International Whaling Commission saying that they had to catch 252 whales for scientific whaling that year. And the reason for ca having to catch 252 whales was that they needed to have the estimate of the variance in natural mortality at 0.38. When pressed, they actually could not explain where either of those numbers came from, except that 0.38 drove the 252. And here's an example of a measure of uh, relative variance and the number of minke whales caught. And you can see that the difference between capturing 100 minke whales and 252 is a, a difference of about 0.45 to 0.38 in the relative variance. So with, without knowing, my assumption has always been in this case that the scientists were told to find a reason for catching 250 whales or so. And we now know, of course, that minke whales caught for scientific whaling by Japan have ended up in commercial markets so that there's a very complex interplay here between the human interests and the scientific conclusions. When I first moved to, to California in 1980, the Mediterranean fruit fly was a uh, pest in Northern California. The Mediterranean fruit fly is a cosmopolitan pest uh, of fruit of all sorts. It is common to have outbreaks of med fly in, Northern California, uh, in Southern California, but rare to have them in Northern California. This medfly infestation had been going on for about uh, five years, four or five years at that point, and, and there was a bit of a clamor to just do something. And ultimately, the just doing something was to, was to spray this entire region of the South Bay with the insecticide malathion that kills adult medfly. There was uh, concern among citizens about having their children sprayed with malathion. And so in order to allay fears, the uh, head of the California Department of uh, Food and Agriculture drank a glass of malathion on television. Now, we actually are going through a similar set of issues right now with an Australian import, the white brown apple moth which uh, has the potential to wreak enormous damage in Northern California. And when uh, pheromone spraying has been proposed, people have objected to it uh, enormously. So there was a clamor to do something, and malathion was sprayed over this entire region. And here's a, here's a close-up of the region. And I believe here's another close-up of the region. Now, I show you this because in this close-up, you can see all the housing developments. And you can see all the green in the housing developments. And in this entire region, the housing developments are filled with citrus trees, orange and uh, lemon and with apple trees and with uh, persimmon trees with lots and lots of fruit trees. So each backyard has fruit trees. I'm going to make an assertion now, kind of crossing that line between environmentalism and environmental science that I should, said you should not do. Just doing something to do something in the absence of thinking usually is not going to do, accomplish much, is useless. My colleague, uh, James Carey, did a simple demographic model of the Mediterranean fruit fly, beginning with the uh, 
assumption that a gravid female somehow comes into an area and lays her eggs. And then he followed the combination of eggs and larva. It is the larva that do the damage, pupa and adults in the population until they were in a kind of equilibrium. Now, here is the most important thing to, to realize, that adults occupy only about 10% of the population at any one time. So what the malathion spraying of adults will do is kill, or uh, uh, the population will kill all of those adults. But there is an enormous pool of pupa and larva and eggs waiting to replace those adults. And in fact, the malathion spring did happen and it had virtually no effect on the medfly outbreak. So the next thing that the California Department of Food and Agriculture ordered is fruit stripping. Everybody was supposed to go out into their backyard and remove all the fruit. Now, think about this from the perspective of a, of a female Mediterranean fruit fly, and you have just a, emerged from a fruit that was not stripped, and now you start looking for the next fruit in which to lay your eggs. And you come to a house in which the fruit has been stripped. So rather than laying eggs, you have to move on. So in fact, fruit stripping could spread the infestation could widen the infestation. Again, an example of doing something without thinking about it turning out to be useless. The uh, medfly example uh, continues to provide very interesting case studies for the distortion of science and policy when they interact. Ultimately, in uh, about 1982, we had a very wet and cold winter, and that seemed to and the infestation. In the 1990s, medfly did not appear in Northern California, but did appear again throughout Southern California. And this is a map showing locations of, of Mediterranean fruit fly finds throughout uh, the, the uh, late 70s, the 80s, and then the late 90s, or late 80s, early 90s. And you can see that some of these locations seem to be consistent spots for finds of the fruit fly, and others seem to be new places. So one can think about this in terms of two competing models, apropos to what we talked about earlier. In one model, every time a new dot appears, we have a new introduction of medfly. So there's been a colonization event, population goes above a detection threshold, it's eradicated, years go by before another introduction happens. The introduction can happen by fr people bringing rotting fruit back from Hawaii or from Mexico and instead of disposing of it properly, throwing it in their compost bin or just in the field behind their house. An alternative model is that, in fact, the population has established itself as endemic rather than exotic, and that it has periodic growth and decline, as many populations do, but every once in a while crosses the detection level. The difference between these two models in terms of Policy, not science, are enormous. In particular, if the medfly is considered to be exotic to California, California receives money from the federal government for medfly control. I don't know if our budget crisis has reached Australia yet, but every bit of money we can get, we'll take. Right? So if it requires saying the medfly is exotic, We'll do it. Second, if the medfly is considered exotic, that means that 
um, scientists for the U.S. Department of Agriculture are assigned to work on controlling medfly, and they get to live in places like Hawaii and Mexico rather than Alabama and Mississippi, where they might be working on bull, uh, bull weevil. So there's this very complicated interplay of the science and the policy. So now I have some specific advice for the next generation of ecologists, who all seem to be kind of clumped over there for some reason. And I will apologize to the women in the audience that all of the advice comes from old, dead white guys. Um, but I think that's just a matter of time. The first uh, piece of advice comes from the science fiction author Frank, uh, Frank Herbert, who said, the highest function of ecology is understanding consequences. That's what we're trying to do. Variation in biology is not noise. It is actually the essence of biology. So, so do not think of variation in your study organisms as something bothersome. Think of it as something essential. John Hammersley was a statistician at the University of Oxford. He wrote a wonderful series of papers on basically how to do statistics that I read just as I was starting graduate school. If anybody is interested in them, I am happy to send them to you. I have PDFs. And Hammersley said, the simpler the tool, the more likely it is to deliver the goods. In other words, when you're trying to bring science to solve a problem, bring the simplest science you, you can. Now that doesn't mean that simplest, simple science is the only thing to do. And in fact, Oliver Wendell Holmes, the great jurist, said that until you have understood the complexity of your system, he doesn't, he, he doesn't care how you simplify it, but once you understand the complexity, continue to try to grab the essence of it. In that regard, we are like artists looking at a complicated world, trying to understand what is the essential feature we want to communicate, and then figuring out a way to communicate it. Some more specific advice. I've talked about the importance of dealing with uncertainty, but one way not to deal with uncertainty is by averaging positions. That is, if you think 50 whales should be caught, and I think zero whales should be caught, a sensible answer is not 25. We need to ask questions such as, what happens if we catch 50 whales to the population under different states of nature? That's called a risk analysis. Don't displace your goals. Remember that we are trying to uh, solve a problem, not achieve some intermediary measure. This particular cover comes from an, an issue of National Fishermen, which talked about the plight of cod in the Gulf of Maine, in which the U.S. Fishery Service had put a, a limit on uh, the fish of 30 pounds of cod per fisherman. That's all a fisherman could bring back from a trip to sell. Bigger fish are usually worth more per pound than smaller fish. And in consequence, hundreds of smaller fish were being thrown overboard after being killed as fishermen kept trying to high grade to find that bigger and bigger cod. So the goal was to conserve cod, and the goal got displaced by using that 30-pound limit. I've already spoken about the importance to recognize the diversity of stakeholders and different values. And I'll talk about that a little bit more momentarily, but that is, as scientists, as ecologists, we do not hold some kind of high moral ground, <clears throat> but we need to recognize other uh, opinions on problems. Indeed, we need to recognize that as scientists we have values. For example, one might think that the purpose of a fishery is conservation. 
We manage the fishery in order to convert, uh, conserve stocks. Or we might think that the purpose of a fishery is to generate wealth and spread it around. That is, we manage a fishery for economic purposes. Or one might think the purpose of a fishery is to maintain the fishing lifestyle and the fishing communities. Each one of these is a perspective on how the fishery works and we choose the perspective we work on because of the values we bring to thinking about the problem. So you need to understand your values. At the same time, science is just not a stakeholder when all the values come to the table. There are some things about science that are irrefutable. All of us study in some disciplinary field, and disciplines are essential because otherwise we would never really learn anything deeply, but they're also an impediment to the kind of work we're talking about here because disciplines tell us what are the right questions and what are the right ways to approach those questions. This is Sir Ari, F oh, I shouldn't point at this, there. This is Sir Ronald Fisher, who more or less created uh, statistics and population genetics. Now, one of the things that Fisher was interested in was the spread of an advantageous form of an allele of a gene, but it can also be viewed as a spread of an, of an advantageous um, form of an insect. And here are some empirical data showing a, a certain kind of leaf hopper in 1985 and 1988 as a fraction of the total population. So you see in 1985, the leaf hopper po population was very high, close to the source, and then dropped off rapidly. Oh, and then in 1986, it's as if this curve shifted over. We call that a traveling wave in the business, because you see it looks, it, it, if you ignore the irregularities, it looks like this has just been shifted to there. As Fisher tried to understand that, what he did was he said, and here's some, some more complicated math, he imagined a population or an allele that grew according to some relationship that involved current size and some parameters, and then spread. And this, in the business, is also called a reaction diffusion equation. Now, um, this is a certain type of equation called a parabolic equation. I have to get into all of this because of this point. At, at the time Fisher did his work, everybody who worked in partial differential equations knew that parabolic equations did not have traveling wave solutions. But because Fisher did not work in partial differential equations, he didn't know that. And consequently, he didn't know not to try to find a solution that was a traveling wave. And when he looked, he discovered one, and he actually created an entire field of, of mathematics on reaction diffusion equations and traveling wave solutions. So this is an example of thinking, out, thinking outside of your discipline. I think you need to read widely and think deeply. We should be seeking insights from geography, history, and anthropology. Many regional problems require a geographic perspective. And for example, if we want to understand the persistence of a species, doing some kind of mathematical analysis may be much less useful than uh, understanding how a city is growing. One needs to seek insights from economics and these are what I call the four horsemen of conservation. The first is density dependence. Density dependence is a biological term that means that as population size increases, the production on an individual basis decreases. 
and that is the justification for almost all harvest paradigms. Common property is the second horseman. Common property is exactly what it sounds like, property that belongs to everyone. But belonging to everyone is often confused as belonging to no one. Open access is a term indicating that anyone may access the resource, and that usually drives towards over-exploitation in a situation in which uh, nobody is profiting from the resource. And discounting is, as it suggests, valuing the future less than the present. And by valuing the future less than the present, we make decisions that adversely affect the future. Each of these needs to be deeply understood from economic as well as biological context. I've already mentioned the uh, line between environmental science and environmentalism and this is very important because environmentalism is actually a political philosophy. It's a political movement that intends to impose ideas upon science. So it is, environmentalism is actually a non-liberal or non-moderate po uh, political philosophy. Seek insights from philosophy, ethics, and religion. If you have never read Aldo Leopold's book, A Scion County Almanac, I encourage you to do so. This is my second book recommendation. It takes place in the sand counties of Wisconsin. I realize <clears throat> that uh, snowy winters and things like that probably don't resonate with most Australians, but the book is uh, an absolutely brilliant book about a conservation ethic. And we need to stop being sophomoric with our, and when we deal with religion. And I'm very happy to give this talk today, because today, as you see, is the anniversary Today must be the 42nd anniversary of a paper by Lynn White in which the environmental crisis was blamed on Western religion. And it is time to stop creating that uh, fictitious gulf and take advantage, as it were, of potential allies. These are all quotations from uh, Jewish scholars about the, the role of the natural world and the role of religion in the natural world, all of which support a conservation ethic. There are two recent books, one by E.O. Wilson and, and one by Joan Roughgarden, about creation and how if one is a... Uh, a believing Christian, one should be working very hard to safeguard creation. And in fact, if you go to the Australian National Museum and spend $10 and go to the Darwin exhibit, you can see Francis Collins, former uh, director of the, uh, the public part of the Human Genome Project, who is also a uh, Christian believer, talking about the consonance between science and religion. This is not a modern phenomenon, as you see from the quotation here. John Calvin, in the 1500s, was writing about the importance of us being stewards of the earth. So we should take advantage of this side of Christianity, of Judaism, of Western religion, and use it to uh, encourage conservation. We need to carefully pick our study species. I've had the pleasure in life of working on some really beautiful and cool organisms. You saw a rockfish before. This is the uh, rosehip fly, it's a fruit, fruit fly, this is southern ocean krill, this is uh, juvenile steelhead trout. But always pick your problems carefully. We need to recognize that we live in a real world and we need to be careful 
of words about words. In other words, we need to be careful how we write and how we speak and what we say. Because there are some things that are real and there are some things that are not. And again, where I come from, one of the things we talk about are the science wars in which science is viewed as a cultural construct and clearly as I said earlier, since scientists have values, there is some culture always to science. But if scientists argue about the exact relationship between how the number of prey consumed is related to the number of prey present, whether it's a straight line or whether it goes up and saturates or whether it, it goes up very slowly and then turns around and saturates, whether we argue about that form or not does not change the fact that the prey are being eaten. Predation is not a social construct. But in the end, the only way to, to do this kind of work is to get involved. And I think that uh, Theodore Roosevelt put it best, that it's easy to sit on the sidelines and criticize and the person who gets into the ring and actually tries to do something is often not going to succeed. But that's where we have to be putting our efforts. And I thank you very much.